In today's video, and by popular vote during my live streams, which I hold on most Sundays by the way, I'm talking about how to start a business with no money. Many of you will be saying, well, you're a barrister, why would you be talking to us about starting a business without money? Well, in addition to being a barrister, I've run several businesses for many years. Actually, my first entrepreneurial flair sort of showed up when I was still at school, age six or seven. Over the years, my businesses have turned over many millions of pounds and we've spent hundreds of thousands of pounds on AdWords. We still run several businesses today, which includes a national retailer and wholesaler, a barrister's chambers and a law firm. And of course, I practice as an independent barrister, both employed by the firm and as a self-employed practitioner. So for this video, there's going to be a few stories along the way, lots of guidance, a few warnings, and hopefully lots of inspiration. But first of all, if you're new to me, as I just said, I'm a barrister who helps you understand law on this channel. So make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon so you receive notifications and you don't miss anything. I answer your questions over on my other channel at Black Belt Secrets, and as I said, I do live streams on Sunday where you can join me live. So before we get into the stories and the guidance, I want to share with you my philosophy of how a business works and becomes successful. So the first and most fundamental principle is that every single business, in one sense or another, is solving some kind of problem. It might solve that problem by providing a product, the product does something. It might be providing a service and the service fulfills a solution to that problem. Either way, every business somehow or another is solving a problem for somebody. So it's all very well when someone is studying business formally and you learn the four P's, product, price, place, promotion, and how to market your products and things like this. But the one most important aspect is usually missing from that teaching which is that you have to solve some kind of problem. So every product that is sold and every service that is provided must be solving some kind of problem, otherwise it is doomed to fail. The second absolutely fundamental principle is that the person driving the business must absolutely have a passion for what it is that they are doing. Not necessarily in the product or in the service, but even if that business is in the business of providing the product or the service, the person must have the passion of driving that forward and providing those products and services to prospective customers. Much like me on this channel here, you can all probably tell that I have a passion for law and I have a passion for helping people. Hence, I put the two together on this channel, although it's not a business. You could measure success by the number of views, the number of subscribers, which I am humble to say has grown dramatically over the last few months when I've committed to doing videos every single day. You'll find a library of my videos if you go to my channel and click videos. There's over 160 or I think 170 videos at the time of recording. So as I said, you can see that there is a passion behind what someone is doing, which will make that successful. If the person finds the thing boring, then clearly there won't be enough passion in it and everybody will be able to tell and ultimately it just won't be a success. And the third essential ingredient to this formula is that you must put your client, your customer, your consumer, or even your viewer at the forefront of your mind when you're developing your business and your strategy. That is the way that this works, and that is how Amazon grew and every other successful business has grown in the past. So as I go through some stories, I'm going to mention these things. Number one, being solving a problem or offering a solution. Number two, having passion for what it is that you are doing. And number three, putting your consumer first. We'll call them the consumer, although that can take the form of a client, a viewer, and so on. So my very first story comes to you from when I was still at school, just about six or seven years old. And at break time, we had a snack tin, which was full of different types of chocolates. You might remember penguin bars, and of course, Kit Kats and various others but there weren't always the options available that other children wanted. I saw this as an opportunity because I was solving the problem. I was obviously passionate about chocolate at that point, and I was putting the choices of other people in mind because that's what they wanted. So I took it upon myself to bring in snacks which I could resell to the other children. I then realized that we could buy a whole pack of 12 maybe chocolate bars and sell them at a marked up price. Now as a segue into the law here, most of those kind of packets will have not for individual resale written on the packet. This is mainly aimed at shopkeepers to say that they shouldn't be splitting them down and selling them individually. 
However, me as an individual, there was no particular contract to enforce that term. I was simply splitting them down and selling them off my own accord. Back in those days, we had the old fashioned lift up desk where you could store things there. So very quickly, this became a stockpile of different snacks. And instead of children buying snacks from the snack tin at break time, there were two queues, one for the snack tin and one for my desk. Because before long, I had a bigger selection of snacks to choose from that children were queuing up. At least that was until the teacher realized what I was doing and shut down my little venture. But the teacher's intervention did not yet put an end to my entrepreneurial days at junior school. Before long, I was into origami. Again, I was passionate about creating things out of paper. I've always been passionate about creating things, as you can see from this channel and the businesses that I've created over the years. So I started creating paper boats, paper hats, paper kermits, you name it, I was making these things out of origami, looking up how they were made, which was very much more difficult in those days. There was no YouTube and no Google. And again, you guessed it, before long, one of the other children asked me whether they could have one of these creations of mine, to which I set the price fairly competitively to what it was with the snacks. First of all, I was just swapping snacks and then exchanging things. And again, before long, I had a queue of children at the desk hoping to pay me to buy one of these things. So how does this relate to my core principles? Well, solving a problem and providing a solution, if other children didn't have the snack that they wanted, I was providing the solution. If other children wanted one of these origami creations, but they couldn't make them or were unwilling to put the time in to learn how to make them, again, I was providing the solution because I would make it for them. Passion? Well, I was obviously passionate about chocolate bars, and indeed I was passionate about helping other people get what they wanted. But I was also passionate about learning things and learning how to create things, so I was passionate with the origami. My passion came through in what I was doing and other people could see that. And putting the consumer first, well obviously the other children's choice in chocolate, I would go out and source the chocolate that they wanted, putting their decisions at the forefront of my little enterprise. Likewise with the origami, if another child wanted a particular particular creation, I would learn how to make it and then I would sell it to them. So that was my second little enterprise, which again before long was shut down and I was faced with an eviction notice from my teacher to empty my desk of my origami and chocolate bars. And just coming back to the title of the video for a moment, you might be thinking, well, this was supposed to be about how to start a business with no money and you're talking about chocolate bars and origami. Well, the principles are exactly the same. If you can create something and then sell it, then it's not necessarily going to require an awful lot of money to do so, particularly if you're buying raw materials and then you are enhancing those raw materials. This brings me onto the enhancement of business and adding of value. And there are a number of different ways of doing this. You can customize something, you can make something more convenient, or you can make something rare. You will always notice that limited edition means there are only 100 or 1,000 or 5,000 of a particular item being produced, Naturally, the price is usually going to be higher for those because there are not many of them made. A bit like limited edition cars. How do you do this with no money? Well, you could offer to make these customizations on something that you don't yet own. Or you could offer your services for something that you are passionate about that solves a problem for something that you haven't yet had to spend any money on. And as I make this video, there are lots of tiny stories that will creep in. For example, I was out in an antique shop and I saw a chair, very nice Victorian looking chair, very good quality, but it was in this tucked away little shop in the middle of nowhere and it was very unlikely that anyone that was willing to buy that was going to come to this shop and find it for sale. So I created an advert online for this particular chair without having bought it yet or spent any money on it, offering it up for a reasonable but enhanced price. I tailored the service to offer a delivery, obviously charging for that delivery, and sure enough, before long, somebody was willing to buy it from me. I called the shop up, purchased the chair, and arranged for it to be delivered. This was one of the catalysts many, many years ago for me partnering up with a company in China to design and manufacture a range of high quality furniture to import to the UK and sell it in a shop here. Of course, this was before the days that the internet exploded and everything was readily available online, which sort of made it a lot more competitive. Part of that furniture business include a custom design and built service, which would take several months, but people could have exactly what they wanted. So again, this was solving the problem and providing a solution. It was clearly something I was passionate about because it was design and creation, which is something that I love 
and putting the customer first, well, the customer got exactly what they wanted because it was a custom design service. But how could you do any of this with no money? Well, if you are a created and a skilled person, or you have access to someone who is creative and a skilled person, you could set up a service whereby you customize certain products. Think about Etsy.com, which is custom made or custom designed products, which you can then advertise online, essentially for free until somebody buys one. But you obviously can charge for your services of customizing these products and get them out there and you get your business started. Just be careful not to trip over any intellectual property rights, which I've come across in my practice, because people often think of a design and then try to copy, imitate that design, that will invariably land you in difficulties with law because companies tend to protect their intellectual property and you may get your shop banned. But skipping back in time once again, when I was 15 or 16, and some of you watching will recognize this story, I was obviously passionate about music, having played the piano and keyboard since the age of about seven. So come to the age of 15 and 16, when I started to need and want a little bit more money to go out and buy what I wanted, I set about finding ways that I could solve a problem and find a solution for something that I was passionate about whilst putting the consumer first, all of which was going to be a successful recipe for a business. Being passionate about music and helping people, I thought to myself that I could put on music workshops to help children and special needs children. So I hand wrote 150 letters handwritten because who doesn't read a handwritten letter? So I wanted to make sure they would read it. I sent these letters to 150 or so schools and daycare centers and institutions across the Midlands in the UK. Many of those wrote back to me, said what a wonderful idea to have someone come along, put on music workshops so they can teach and enjoy music at the same time. It was particularly well received by the special needs schools that didn't usually have this kind of a service. In fact, to this very day, the sessions I put on at those schools are my most treasured memories because some of those children were captured on camera smiling and laughing for the very first time, even though they were 15 and 16 years old. All of the staff jumped around with cameras taking these photographs and the whole session was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. So I went along and I did these sessions for many schools and daycare centers throughout the summer, charging two to 300 pounds a session, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, turning up with my electronic keyboard, various other musical equipment, reinvesting some of the money to buy more equipment, doing games with the children and so on. It was a barrel of laughs for everybody concerned. Everybody learned something, everybody enjoyed it. And those places were calling me for around 10 years after that initial summer. But of course I'd moved on to different businesses by then. So I handed off the contacts to some other students that I knew that were still at school. So again, coming back to my principles, this was providing the solution to a problem, i.e. what do these schools do to keep children enthusiastic about music or in daycare centers, what do they do to keep the children entertained? Obviously I had a passion for the music because I'd been playing for many years and obviously I was putting the end consumer first because I was tailoring those sessions to what they wanted. Some of them just wanted musical games, some of them wanted it to be a little bit more educational and I could combine the two where necessary. But all the while this was a business that I set up and ran without putting any money into it. I just put the time into writing the letters, sending them out to the institutions, and then organizing and turning up at the sessions. Other ways of setting up a business with no money might include sourcing products and reselling them for a markup. I'm not just talking about drop shipping, which was quite the phenomenon when it first came in, but now there are so many different websites offering drop shipping services. I think you have to be a little bit different and offer that little bit more value to really make it work. For example, you could advertise often for free online your services to source and find ideal products to solve a problem or interior design that is customized and tailored to your client's desires. You may charge for your services and not put any markup on the products or you might do it the other way around and not charge for your services and insist that they purchase the products from you. And you can set this up by way of contract because so long as there is an intention to create legal relations between you and the terms are sufficiently clear and certain, then these contracts can be upheld. And there are many creators online that are selling products in this way or selling their services in this way. 
all of which you are solving a problem, you're doing it with passion, and you are tailoring it and putting your consumer first. And using that exact philosophy and model in a very modern sense for my barrister's chambers that I set up, which is now very successful, I set about helping other barristers to market their practice and finding new clients, which lots of barristers found difficult to do because they are not trained or experienced in marketing, although it is becoming much more essential these days, particularly with those barristers that want to do public access work, which obviously does not come via a solicitor. Many of you may not know that before 2004, you had to go to a solicitor in order to instruct a barrister. So when this changed after many, many years in 2004 and barristers could become authorized to accept what is called public access instructions, i.e. instructions without a solicitor, the barrister was then left with the choice of, well, do their chambers do the marketing for them and still provide them with the work? Or does the barrister go out and do their own advertising and marketing to find work for themselves? And of course, many barristers just don't have the knowledge or experience in doing that, or simply they don't want to do that. So when I set up my barrister's chambers, I already had a database of around 20,000 businesses. This was pre-GDPR and the concerns that that throws up. But we emailed all of the businesses on our database, offering them a free consultation with a barrister of up to 20 minutes. And we had barristers who agreed to this concept of providing the initial 20 minutes with a view to perhaps quoting for further work. Sure enough, before long, we had streams of inquiries coming in, work being generated, and the business of our barristers chambers was born, all of which without spending a penny. But if you don't already have a database of contacts that you can tap into to start a business in this way, I'm reminded of the days that I trained to be a stockbroker with a major firm. And believe me, you need to know how to solve a problem, be passionate, and put the client first. Because as a stockbroker, you have to generate all of your clients yourself. And the key ingredient to making this work is starting with your current network. Even if you can only initially reach out to 50 to 100 people, you make those solid contacts and you ask for referrals. You don't necessarily try to sell anything to the person that you contact, but you can say, I'm starting a business and I would really appreciate it if you can put me in touch with two or three other people to chat about this business with and what I might be able to offer. Almost everyone you know will have a contact that will be interested in whatever service and business that you are setting up. So asking them whether they can introduce you to someone that you can help is an excellent first way of getting a list of contacts that you can access. Secondly, there are still traditional network meetings held, although most of these can now be found online with business groups on Facebook and so on. Lots of these networks work because each member will recommend your services to anyone they come across that needs your services. So you pull together effectively as a team to help each other out, all of which is either usually free or very minimal investment. So when it comes to understanding how you can start a business with no money, Think of it as what you are passionate about and what problem that solves. And then when you put your prospective client at the forefront of everything you do, then whatever you do will become successful. So let me know if you found these stories interesting and if you'd like to hear more about how I made all of these things work. And if you become a channel member, I will help you along the way because I've made lots of mistakes that I can help you to avoid. So in the meantime, don't forget to like this video and remember, stay humble and subscribe.